skip through in the interest of time some of uh, because you know dr deepak has already largely covered what we actually need to know with regard to uh, uh, kyphoplasty um, which is how to actually um, go transpedicular into the uh, vertebral body huh? so i'll start with you know basically talking about vertebroplasty because i think that is kind of more relevant in terms of trying to understand uh, what is it that we are trying to accomplish and what are we hoping for so cementing is essentially uh, the topic now aging will affect all of us provided we live long enough so the only way to avoid it is to die young um now if you look at the riddle of the sphinx from about uh, 5000 bc then uh, the riddle of the sphinx was uh, what has one voice four footed two footed and three footed so if you went up to the sphinx and you couldn't answer then the sphinx ate you up and obviously the answer was man or the human because we are on all fours when we are children and then as we become adults um we sort of start uh, becoming two footed and then as we age we become three footed so one of the major biomechanical significance of this riddle is uh, how do we you know maintain this transition from being four footed to two footed and then not lapse into becoming three footed over time um so degeneration is one of the major causes for the postural change that happens and this is contributed to by um the add-ons like osteoporosis trauma collapse uh, which may be secondary to tumors or malignancies so if you look at a standard uh, example this is from uh, quite a little while ago i'm sorry it's, it's can you see that maybe if you switch off the light it's not projecting very well but essentially this is an 80 year old woman who uh, presents with uh, severe back pain following a trivial fall at home so she was initially treated conservatively with a tlso brace and uh, medical treatment for osteoporosis unfortunately continued to remain symptomatic with severe back pain ah, so this is more visible so this is her x-ray sort of four weeks later um this is her lying down so this is the supine x-ray and then as soon as she stands up you can see what is happening to so the area is just completely the segment is just collapsing down and the reason why that has happened um why that is happening is uh, very evident so she has this large vertebral cleft what we think of as the so called cumel lesion um which is essentially like a an osteonecrosis of the uh, vertebral body um and that is what causes a sort of fairly dramatic uh, collapse in the uh, vertebral body so what are our options here we can continue with conservative care we can do a surgical fixation in this 81 year old with osteoporosis um or we can consider doing some form of cementing so a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty so what i did was a vertebroplasty and as you can see that cement has beautifully filled the whole of the cleft has restored height and and this is what it looks like and the lady did uh, you know very well from a symptomatic point of view so essentially what is vertebroplasty it's a percutaneous technique for the treatment of spinal pain and which involves interosseous injection of uh, acrylic cement under some form of image guidance now this was described as far back as 1984 by these two gentlemen calibert and deremont um in france and they use this technique to actually obliterate a c2 hemangioma and then subsequently people kind of started using this for uh, osteoporotic or vertebral uh, compression fractures um so the main indications are pain because of osteoporotic fractures metastasis particularly uh, myelomas um and uh, prostatic uh, meds um wedge fractures of uh, other descriptions which for whatever reason are not healing well um and you can do it prophylactically uh for elderly people with uh, at risk vertebrae particularly say adjacent to fusion segments uh if you're looking at it um and nobody actually uh, fully understands the mechanism of action of how it works um because 
you know the technique works even with uh, very tiny amounts of cement so you can inject you know even as little as one and a half two cc's of cement and and patients are asymptomatic um so we're not entirely sure how or why it works but it does and there are various theories acrylic bonding uh, of the fracture fragments um, maybe the thermal uh, obliteration of the nerve endings um, in the end plate um, and then just the physical um, cementing which actually uh, uh, stops movement uh, between the fracture fragments now the contraindications are very intuitive uh, so if you have a fracture extending to the posterior vertebral cortex if you have a retropulse fragment if there is cord compression if there is significant radiculopathy um, if there is significant likelihood of infection as in fever or sepsis uh, if there is coagulopathy and obviously in a very um, morbidly unwell patient uh, who is not likely to um withstand the sedation or uh, general anesthesia the risks of the procedure are thankfully um generally very low we <laughs> say normally less than a 1% rate of any major complications um the complications commonly are um extrusion of the cement that is the most common complication so it will commonly go into the epidural or paraspinous veins um can occasionally go into the spinal canal which is the most dreaded complication um and then you can have systemic uh, cement embolization i was trying to locate uh, one x-ray that i had spectacular x-ray of of the whole lung just uh, you know filled with uh, cement um so it was amazing and the patient was absolutely asymptomatic and and this was just found because he incidentally had a chest x-ray as part of his screening um for uh, his prostatic uh, metastasis so amazing x-ray but apart from that you can get things like fat embolism from the marrow um, you can get infections um in general the procedure is exactly what uh, dr deepak has described for uh, doing a percutaneous pedicle screw so you can do it under uh, local normally you don't even need sedation unless the patient is very apprehensive uh very rarely we use uh, ga for patients who cannot lie prone at all either because of pain or because of respiratory symptoms so this is how um you know you set it up so exactly like you would do a pedicle screw um so ap and lateral and exactly you're targeting the pedicle uh, you're targeting uh, when we do a vertebroplasty normally we try and do it single side um generally i don't do routinely vertebroplasty bilaterally yeah? because usually if you get your angulations right you can actually center the needle into the center of the vertebra just by sort of using this 2 o'clock and then you know medial angulation um cleverly um so you know take your time you fiddle around a little bit until you get your uh, needle bang into the middle of the vertebral body um and then one sided vertebroplasty will often give you you know good uh, diffusion of cement across the midline and what are we looking for you want cement to go on both sides of the midline and you want cement to go as much as possible to the upper and lower end plate yeah so you want up and down the cement to go and laterally across the midline so and usually you know that is enough and if you do that that is kind of more than adequate um we can also commonly do it for um so again i'll just show you a quick video of a vertebroplasty here hmm why is in this thing playing okay so this is a 68 year old man who had a fall at home in the bathroom and then you know he developed this um which prolapse sorry i'm having trouble playing this video okay what we can do is i can just uh, show it from uh, the video itself yeah 
so this is a 68 year old man who has uh, this wet fracture following a fall now we've treated him uh, medically for about four weeks uh, with analgesia and uh, bracing um, this is a CT and then you can see that the posterior cortex is still intact but sort of significant uh, osteoporosis and uh, sort of multiple little cracks here and there he still got you know not too bad height preservation um, so that is why we kind of thought to go with the uh, vertebro with the kyphoplasty rather than yeah so this is this MRI So I'll just fast. So, okay. So this is the um, trick. So get the needle in. Now, kyphoplasty, when we do, uh, by and large, it is better to do bilaterally because it's very difficult to actually get the balloon symmetrically in the midline and then uh, get a good uh, thing. So, you know, you have to put the, um, you have to cannulate the pedicle bilaterally. Um, the other sort of uh, issue with, uh, doing a kyphoplasty is you need a much wider uh, needle than you normally would do. So normally we'd say use a 11 jamshidi, but for a kyphoplasty, the vast majority of systems would use an 8 French um, jamshidi type needle um, because this balloon has to go into it. Yeah? So this is, you know, a standard uh, kyphoplasty. So this is the, the balloon in the front. Um, so you have to get this through the needle into the vertebral body and the idea is that you get it into the center of one side of the vertebral body, one half of the vertebral body, and then you blow up the balloon. So what this will do is this will compress the cancellous bone so that the cancellous bone that you have compressed forms a little shell, like a little eggshell. And, and so you create a cavity in the middle into which you actually passively deposit cement. Now, because you have created this cavity by, by using this balloon, so you can see that you know both sides, there are two needles, and then you can see that the balloon is getting inflated. So you normally inflate this with the dye so that you can see it. Otherwise, if it is air, uh, you, don't, you can't see the balloon, yeah? So you fill the syringe with a standard omnipaque uh, sol solution and then you inflate the balloon with that. Um, the inflation will also have a pressure gauge and most systems will come with what is their maximum uh, amount of inflation that you can do or maximum amount of PSI that you can uh, subject the balloon to. Um, usually, you know, you don't really need to struggle that much and the whole idea is to create that space. Yeah? Now, the other thing I would say is, you know, don't agonize too much about lifting up the end plates. You know, normally that doesn't tend to happen other than um, just sort of within the end plates itself, uh, uneven uh, areas will be elevated. Huh? But you can't really normally lift this end plate to make it to that height. So if you try attempting all that, what will happen is that you'll just end up fracturing the end plate. So don't go for that. So try and leave it at the height that it is at you know, without being too brave in terms of pushing it. And then once you've done that, and then both the balloons have been inflated, um, then you basically remove the balloon. And in the cavity that you have now created, uh, you can put in cement. Now the advantage is when you're doing it this way, and uh, you have this bilateral balloons, um, then you can use cement, which is much further down in terms of the time. So it is much more viscous. So the likelihood that it will leak into um, the veins or it will leak into the spinal canal is much less because you are using much thicker consistency cement than say when you do a vertebroplasty. And since you're also putting it through a much wider needle, again, you can have it a much thicker consistency. Yeah, so the thinner the needle, the thinner needs to be your cement or the more liquid your cement needs to be. And the more liquid the cement is, the more possible there possibility there is that it will leak into uh, epidural veins or into the spinal canal. Yeah? Whereas the thicker the cement is, and if you're putting it into a cavity, the less likely that this is going to go into a venous system. Yeah? So there, so now the cement is being uh, put in.
So in all these systems, you know, the vertebroplasty and things, you know, various companies have different systems. Uh, the one that I used to find most user-friendly, unfortunately, has disappeared from the market, which used to be the Depew Johnson's something called Confidence, um, that had a really nice, very user-friendly system, and then one needle, and then and that was it. Um, so the one that we are currently using is the Metronic one, which is a little fiddly. I mean, there are too many steps involved in putting it. Uh, but it's okay. You get the hang of it after a while. So this is what it finally looks like once we have done. One followed by other. Because if you do it simultaneously on both sides, you can't see what is happening, you know? Um, and the thing, the trick with the cement, remember, is that the chaos happens in a matter of seconds. So when you're injecting the cement, you want to be tracking it absolutely, you know, diligently and minutely. And remember, you know, it's a patient who's awake, they're breathing. So it's not a very easy task to monitor your cement as it's going in. So if you're now doing it with both hands simultaneously, you're not going to track it. And then that cement will go somewhere and you will discover later on uh, all sorts of chaos happening. So one at a time. Okay, um, no, the, uh, okay, I'll tell you why not. Because, you know, you want your balloon to actually move all the cancellous bone to create that shell. So once you do it on one side and you cement it, then it is very difficult for, you know, the other balloon to then push it. And then you don't want the other balloon to push your fresh ball of cement. So then you'll have to wait for that cement to solidify before you, you do the other ballooning. And then you're going to end up using two packets of cement. Now, again, as Dr. Deepak says, we, you know, we are driven by costs. So when one packet of cement would do, why do you want to use two, you know? So, yeah, so do the, you know, put in the two needles and then take the biopsy. Uh, and another sort of very important step. Um, always, 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 you know, remember to send the biopsy. It's kind of routine. You're there. You're anyway also having to uh, put in uh, um, a little... You know, you are having to make the track with uh, uh, with a drill, so you may as well use send those fragments off for histopathology. Surprising what you sometimes get. You know, I've had patients whom I didn't suspect anything, who you know showed a myeloma. One person showed a TB. Um, so you know, you just assume it's osteoporotic, but you know, common things are common, and elderly people will often have pathological fractures in addition to osteoporosis, you know. No, no, dye is not there. The dye is inside your balloon. Remember, so there is no dye, because if you put dye without the balloon, the dye will just go into the blood. The dye is not... Yeah, no, no, because no, no. it is you are inflating the balloon with the dye. So when you deflate the balloon, you are taking out the dye. Otherwise, how does the balloon deflate? No, no actually, see, it is all in uh, different compartment. You are putting balloon, expanding it to just see that where that balloon lies. You are using that. Yeah, with dye, yeah. and then we remove complete see, system. See, if you if you think of the yeah, it's no, like no, no, deflating. No, no, no. No, I think. See, think of a water balloon. Yes. So what are you inflating the balloon with? With water. Here, the inflating agent for the balloon is a dye. Is dye. So there is... Yes. Because if you don't take out the dye, the balloon, you, there is no way the balloon will come out. Because the balloon is swollen there inside. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. So deflate the balloon, remove the... Yeah. Like, ultimately, dye will come out and then you will take it out. So another thing like in these cadavers, see, uh, those who are doing on the cadavers, these are normal cadavers. These are not osteoporotic things. So don't keep pushing things up. It will rupture. And it <laughs> ruptures. Yeah. yeah, unless you are lucky enough to have an old uh, patient as, a, as, your, uh, uh, as your cadaver. Yeah, you so know. ultimately it is a so. procedure that you have to do. Don't push it. We have only 260. What are the, these guys have provided? If they get, get uh, dysfunction, then nobody else will be doing it. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, different systems have their own pressures built into it. So say, you know, the, like the Medtronic ones that we use, I think 
it starts with zero psi and then you can take it up to a maximum of about 110 i think uh, um, pounds per square inch so which is a lot normally what you will find is the more osteoporotic the patient is the less pressure you need to inflate the balloon yeah but if you find in a say a relatively young patient um, and then if the bone quality is good then you're often having to put a lot of uh, pressure to to inflate the balloon but beyond say 100 or 110 the system will tell you you cannot inflate it any more than that because the balloon will just burst yeah absolutely yeah yeah you can remove it but then you know you'll have the dye flowing out then the dye will go here and there it doesn't matter it's omnipaque so yeah, again you're matters, using see, uh, the practical question is like when you you get ruptured and dye is everywhere you you will be not monitoring like where cement goes and That's what are right. the limits yeah. ba main, main idea is like to fill everything with the cement yeah so you don't want the situation of see the other thing to remember is that if the balloon just has a little linear tear and then collapses that's fine you know but if there are bits of the plastic of the balloon lying inside the vertebral body you don't want that ideally yeah so <laughs> like yesterday's comments see everything looks easy but it it can create a maze like somebody was saying that easy go is not that easy <laughs> like yesterday everybody has that experience so ultimately it's like it looks simple steps look simple yeah Sorry, uh -huh. so this is just a quick uh, thing. Yeah. Um, so a uh, 50-year-old chap with uh, aggressive uh, CA prostate. And then you can see he's got these uh, osteoplastic um, or osteoblastic uh, metastasis. But on the MRI, you can kind of see that these are heavily infiltrated marrow. And he was having severe disabling back pain. So this is a man in whom we did this sort of two-level vertebroplasty and very good result, you know, and uh, he could be mobilized. So now, finally, just a little bit to address this long-standing debate about kyphoplasty versus vertebroplasty, which is better, which is good. Now, one thing, I mean, you know, any of you who will start looking at the literature about vertebroplasty, there is a huge amount of controversy, uh, primarily created by these two sort of uh, very often quoted and landmark papers um, by these two gentlemen um, in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2009, uh, which actually compared vertebroplasty to a sham procedure. So one of them just did a subcutaneous injection and the other person actually took them to OR and, and, uh, and did injections into the periosteum of the lamina and the transverse process. Um, and they had not very large numbers in either of those uh, series. So one series had 78 patients who were randomized to either uh, vertebroplasty or sham, and the other series had uh, 118 patients. But then there was some complex thing of they could cross over. Yeah. But net net, the result of these two papers were uh, they said that in the randomized study there was no difference between sham versus vertebroplasty. So that created a huge controversy about whether vertebroplasty is a procedure worth doing or not, okay? The controversy still lives till today because um, so far we've really not had a very clear-cut um, randomized double-blinded trial which has shown that vertebroplasty is more effective than doing nothing. But there is a lot of data which have looked at case series, which have looked at, you know, partially randomized trials, um, and they've all shown that in well-selected patients, vertebroplasty does reduce pain. So if you keep your yardstick as telling a patient that you know your main problem is pain um, and that this procedure will uh, improve your pain, um, then in well-selected patients who have had four to six weeks of conservative treatment and who are not helped by that and who are showing progressive wedging or increasing segmental kyphosis, uh, I personally have found vertebroplasty to be always useful. But the thing always to remember is that anecdote is not science. Um, and uh, a lot of medical literature is fraught with things which were done because they seem to be helpful. Uh, and we didn't know any better. And so we were doing it. So I think it's very important for all of us as doctors also to remember that we are also scientists and to constantly question what we do and just not take it 
that just because it is being done it is good then and we should all do it okay so i think we should always have that little uncertainty principle in the back of our mind to say that okay fine number one do no harm so the good thing about vertebroplasty kyphoplasty is that the rate of complications is generally very small yeah number two remember that at this point in time it is still medically or scientifically unproven that that they are helpful but anecdotally yes they are um, now between vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty almost comparable the rate of pain relief um, so but vertebroplasty is um, uses less bone cement um, can do it via unilateral approach um, and there is now a fair amount of evidence to say that the more cement you put into a segment the more stresses biomechanically are transmitted to adjacent bones which now are not as biomechanically rigid as the bone that you have cemented so particularly with the kyphoplasty there's a fair amount of evidence that there is a higher rate of adjacent segment fractures so with the vertebroplasty since you put in lesser amounts of cement the artificial stiffness that you're creating is less and so there are lesser adjacent segment uh, fractures um, but if you look at the height restoration which is the touted reason for why one should do a kyphoplasty versus a vertebroplasty then there is actually no statistical difference between vertebroplasty versus kyphoplasty they both achieve very similar degrees of height restoration um, kyphoplasty is slightly safer as i said because of this artificial eggshell that you're creating and the thicker viscosity of uh, cement that you can use um, so the incidence of leakages into disk spaces into venous systems is less um, but obviously kyphoplasty is almost 10 times more expensive in terms of the equipment yeah because for a vertebroplasty all you need is a jam shady needle and cement um, whereas for a kyphoplasty depending on the system you use you're talking about minimum 60 70 thousand rupees to say the medtronic system costing about one and a half lakhs for two balloons so there's a huge difference in price yeah thank you yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. See, again, remember that fresh fractures do not need. Uh, so if you have, say, you know, if your father or your mother falls in the bathroom tomorrow. No, you know, nothing. No, no, no. Just give them give them a few days of uh, rest it doesn't have to be bed rest you know whatever they can tolerate give them some good analgesia you know you know, regular paracetamol some nsaids if it's not contraindicated some tramadol if that is not contraindicated give them a belt um, to wear and uh, see how they do the vast majority of patients will become pain free in four to six weeks so we're talking about 80 percent of osteoporotic wedge fractures will become pain free and will become you know will stop sort of wedging further down in sort of four to six weeks we really only advocate this procedure for patients who at four to six weeks are still symptomatic um, are unable to mobilize uh, are still requiring a lot of analgesia or who are showing progressive kyphosis on uh, progressive wedging on on uh, cdl x-rays yeah Okay, um, if you look at the MRI, the most important finding per se to say whether you would at all do a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty is to show that there is marrow edema. Yeah, and the best sequence to look for marrow edema is the T2 stir. Yeah, um, so only if they have edema in the marrow is it worthwhile doing because you can see a lot of elderly people will have wedge fractures and if they are old wedge fractures doing vertebroplasties or kyphoplasties into them is completely pointless so unless there is evidence that the fracture is fresh number one number two the fracture on the mri must correlate with clinical tenderness or pain when you either percuss um, that spinous process or when you sort of you know push on that spinous process so there must be some local pain that that happens um, 
if they have multiple uh, levels then again you know the t2 stir is very helpful to know which is the acute one which is the one causing problem and then yeah See, whether the superior and inferior end plates uh, will often not be intact. That is a whole uh, point. Um, now, what you really want, the one end plate that you want intact is the posterior cortex has to be intact. Yeah? If the posterior cortex is fractured, then the likelihood of cement leakage into the uh, spinal canal is sort of very high. Um, so you tend to avoid doing a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty in these patients. Do you know how much to do inside the plate? No. Extrusion into the disc space just looks bad on the x-ray, but so far has not shown to be of any prognostic significance. Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, we do that frequently. The other thing to remember is that uh, the common thing that we use, which is methyl methacrylate, yeah, will stop the bone from actually fusing or healing normally. So we should use you know, this methyl methacrylate only in patients where we are not expecting them to develop spontaneous fusion with time. So never use methyl methacrylate to do a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty in a young person who has a, a, a fresh fracture. Yeah, because what you will do is actually stop his normal bony union from happening. Yeah? So this is only for patients where you're not... In a young patient, if you have to do a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty, it's always best to use calcium phosphate cement. Uh, so you do get that now. And uh, you, know, you can use that for a vertebroplasty if you want to do that as a part of your fusion or if you're looking at bone that potentially can fuse in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, no harm. You know, you can use uh, calcium phosphate cement in uh, in all patients. Uh, it's just, you know, difficult to get hold of, and uh, you know, hopefully, it'll become more readily available. Uh, but yes, you know, you How much can. Is the cost in both of them? No, there, there's not much cost. They both cost about the same. It's just the thing. It's also it's slightly more fiddly to use. The amount of time, you know, it it sets very quickly. Uh, it's much more viscous and thick, so you normally need to, if you're putting in calcium phosphate, you have to ideally use an 8 French needle. It will not normally go down through a 11 French needle. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, the viscosity is not different. The, it's the same cement that you're using. It's no different. But you see, the cement hardens with time. So say you mix the cement with the liquid and then start the, the uh, catalysis, uh, you know, the catalytic process happening. And then the cement hardens. Now normally, let's say the cement will take about 15 minutes to become completely hard. Now you normally start injecting cement after about three to four minutes, depending on your uh, ambient temperature, yeah? So if the cement has come out fresh out of the refrigerator before you start mixing it, then at three to four minutes, it's still often very liquid. But if the cement has been lying around outside for a little while and is already a little warm, then it will set faster. So the higher the temperature, the faster the cement will set. Now, in this grade, you just mechanically, you know, manually see uh, how thick the cement is. Now, ideally, what we say is that, you know, when you try to inject the cement, if the cement starts coming out vertically rather than falling straight down, then that is a good time to start injecting, yeah? Because then it is just thick enough to start not wandering here and there. Now, when you do a vertebroplasty and you're using a 11 gauge needle, then you ideally want to start injecting at about three to four minutes because after that, if the cement becomes too hard, it will not go through that narrow needle. But when you're doing a kyphoplasty, number one, you're using an eight gauge needle. So your bore is much wider. And so you can wait for the cement to become a little bit more hard. So you can say wait for five minutes or six minutes. And because you're injecting it through a wide needle, you can put much more mechanical force to, to get out this sort of slightly thicker cement. So it's the same cement, 
but you're using it a little later in the setting cycle. That's all. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much, sir. Means like rest of the question we can have during the demonstration.